When John was asked by a deputation of the Jews that were sent to him, who are you? It's interesting to, to see that the more John said, actually the less he said. The Jewish leaders asked, are you the Christ? His answer, I am not the Christ. Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet of Deuteronomy 18? No. Well, well, well then who are you? Nothing. Just a voice. And the very fact that John saw himself as nothing, brothers and sisters, is what allowed God to make him a voice. See, if there's one thing that prevents God speaking through people, it's when we insist on speaking for ourselves. It's only when we're able to divest ourselves of self that God can take our mouth and, and use that mouth for his purpose. If we don't need brothers and sisters who go around the ecclesia speaking their mind, what we need is brothers and sisters who are going to speak God's mind. And we can only do that, as John is going to show us, when we empty ourselves of our own thoughts that we might be filled with God's. I am not the Christ. I am not. No. Well, then who are you? Just a voice. You know, it's interesting that of he of whom it was said that he's the greatest prophet born among women, we have just one verse of scripture that spans 30 years of his life. And I'd like you to just focus on that verse of scripture now with me in Luke chapter 1 and at verse 80. You know, much like the testimony about our Lord Jesus Christ, we have just a glimpse of him there, don't we, in the temple, dazzling the, the doctors of the law. But Although this one verse spans 30 years of John's life, it, it really fits his purpose absolutely beautifully. Luke 1, the very last verse. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit. His parents are probably have now passed off the scene and was in the deserts until the day of his showing unto Israel. And as, as we've been repeating throughout the classes, he's in the deserts. That's where God's voice can be heard. That's where he can be understood. We have to isolate, don't we, ourselves from this world. You know, I don't think that, you know, that God expects any of us, brothers and sisters, to live like John the Baptist. You know, we're taught in the book of Ecclesiastes to live a, a basic life, having contentment with food and raiment. You know, he doesn't expect us to live like John the Baptist, but what he is saying is that we have to cut off ourselves from this world, go out into a desert even if in our minds, and they are uncluttered from society, we can hear the voice of God. And that was his message. He lived his message. He was in the desert for all of those years in a world that, that seethed in intrigue and all of its class distinctions. The voice was crying, come out here, come out here and learn something about God. But that verse says, something else. John the Baptist claimed to be just a voice. Now I understand that when you have a voice, you listen. But what does that verse say? He was in the deserts until the day of his showing unto Israel. So they were looking at something. It wasn't just that they were hearing a voice, they were seeing something as well. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about John, he said in Luke 7 verse 24, what went she out to see? So it wasn't just a voice, although John claimed to be only that. They were seeing something about. There was something they saw in his character that was impressive too. And we need to go down this morning and we need to have a look at him. This was exhibition in the wilderness, his exhibition in the desert. Well, well what do we see? Let's come to Matthew chapter 3, because Matthew gives us those details. What went ye out to see, said the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, here he is. And everyone would have seen him. You know, as we turn up that reference, let's just have a look at the, the layout of, of the land where John was. John was in the wilderness, the deserts, until the day of his showing. So he was here in the, the wilderness of Judea, which is very inhospitable terrain, very difficult to, 
to, to walk through because it's just up and down and up and down and up and down, very dry. He was in the wilderness until the day of his showing unto Israel. Now, when John appeared on the scene to the, to the nation of Israel, he moved out of the wilderness and he went down here on the valley floor, which as we know is the lowest spot on the earth, just north of the Dead Sea on the Jordan River, and there he manifested himself to the people. And everyone would have been looking down on him. These hills, where you see this, this rough part of the map, those hills are about 3,000 feet above sea level. John is down here on the valley floor, probably about 1,400 feet below sea level. So everybody's looking down on him. It's like they're in a grandstand, and down there on the valley floor is this, this aberration. What were they all looking at? Everybody would have seen him looking down the valley floor, down the amphitheater of nature. Matthew chapter 3, this is what they saw. Verse 3. But this is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying, In the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And this same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Now that is the total of John's possessions. One leather girdle and one camel's hair garment. He had nothing. He was completely undistracted by this world. That was all he had. As we said, a camel skin doesn't have to be dry cleaned too often, and grasshoppers don't need much cooking. And because of that, he was available. God could get through to him. God could speak to him. Now, it's interesting that there's a fascinating difference. We saw the parallels, didn't we, with Elijah. And Elijah was dressed in nature, um, you know, like, a, like a piece of granite that was just cut out of the, the escarpment of Gilead. But of Elijah, it said that his clothing was the skin of an animal. It doesn't say what one. But of John, we're told what animal it was. Because it says there in verse 4 that it was camels. Now, why, why would the scriptures note that? Well, you know, the camel of all creatures, brothers and sisters, is made by the creator for the desert. It's the ship of the desert. You look at the unique features of a camel. A camel has special foot pads which mold itself to the, the sand of the desert. If you put a camel on rocky ground, he's hopeless. But if you put him on the sand of the desert, he's, he's absolutely sure. He has a hump in which to store his food. The poor camel doesn't know how long he's going to have to be trotting. So he has a hump that stores food. He's got a massive three-chambered stomach in which to store water so that he can constantly have a, a replenishment. His nostrils are all pinched in. So you see the, the blowing sands of, of the desert can't get in his nose because they're pinched in. It has lips that are like leather, so can eat cactus and all of the, the plants that are, that are in the desert. It sheds its coat just before the hot weather. So it has a thick coat in the winter, and it has a small coat in the summer. It can go 100 miles in 12 hours. And if it needs, it can go for four successive days without a rest, keeping going and keeping going and keeping going and keeping going. And John's clothed in him. Now you look at, look at those characteristics. Doesn't the word of God need to be in several chambers of our thinking? Don't we need to have special shoes to get through the terrain of the world? You know, don't we need to have food stored up in case of a, a long trial that we're going through? Don't we need to have our nostrils you know, pinched in so we, we don't get the, the, the degrading sands of criticism and, and negativity in there? You know, we need to wear warm coats in the winter to prepare for the, the trials of the winter. And then when the hot weather is beating down on us, we need to have our, our thin coats. He's adapted to his circumstances. And John's clothed in him. That's what God is saying to us in that camel. He is made for the desert. And so must we. We've got to be made, not for this world, and to be conformed to that, but to be made for the desert. And, you know, the camel was unclean under the law of Moses. He's a priest. And John's clothed in him. What God has cleansed, brothers and sisters, no man was to dare call common or unclean. 
That message was reverberating out of John. What went ye out to see? Well, he's dressed in that because that's the way that we have to be. Adapted to hardship. Adapted to the difficulties of the desert. Having the word of God in, in several chambers of our, our thinking. And what was his, uh, his energy bar? His, ener- his uh, strength? It was locusts. Now, who would live on locusts? I'm told... They taste like almonds, which I've never put to the proof, but that's what I'm told. Now, this seemed like a strange thing to eat locusts until the days in which we live, and you can go to Whole Foods and and pick up yourself a bag of chirps, which are sort of a a cricket-based potato chip now. But everything about this man is is linked with the desert. He's eating locusts. Now, locusts were clean under the law of Moses, depending on what type. You see, if a creature, if a little locust could, could spring above the earth, you could eat it. God didn't authorize them to eat anything that groveled in the, in, in the dirt. But if a little creature could go doing like that, he's clean. Now, you think about the message of John the Baptist. What is he counseling us to do? Get above this life. Spring above by setting our affection upon what's above. Get away from the world. Get away from the earth. Go out into the desert. And if you can spring above, you're clean. And he's eating those grasshoppers. That was his message. He wasn't asking us to do any more than what he's doing himself. He lived his message. You've got to get away from this world if ever God is going to, to speak to you. Now, what were the locusts flavored with? Well, they're flavored there with wild honey. Now, it doesn't mean sort of angry honey that that is wild in in that sense. The word really means natural honey. And where is it found in the land of Israel? It's mostly found in the desert under a rock. So Deuteronomy chapter 32 talks about how I gave them honey out of the rock. Now, this picture here is a picture of Bethsaida, which is one of the, the places you can visit in the land of Israel today. Now, what happened when we went to Bethsaida is in all of these rocks that you see here, the bees had made their nest. And they were making honey in between all of these rocks here. Actually, there were so many bees and so many wasps that we actually couldn't visit Bethsaida because we would have, you know, we would have been stung. So there was honey out of the rock. So, but again, everything about this, this man is connected with the wilderness, with the desert, And notice the context of Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 talks about how God, in in his blessings upon upon Israel, he gave them honey out of the rock. And you know what it says two verses later? It says, I have brought you into a waste-howling wilderness that I might instruct you. And in that context, we read about honey out of the rock. Now, what what is John doing? Come out into the wilderness and learn something about God that I might instruct you. It was in the wilderness where the instruction of the word takes place. And we can't do that literally. But we have to do it in our minds. Close the door to our studies. Go out at least in our minds. Walk out into the backyard. And sit down and and open the word. But how are we ever going to do that? Where we sit down and we open the Bible and we read for five minutes and then ding. And then we 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 address whatever the ding is. And okay, when what's this verse saying to me? We read another two minutes and then ding. Now how are we ever going to understand the Bible like that? How are we ever going to hear God's voice? You know, put those things away. They're being they're dragging us away all, all the time. Put the cell phone away. Turn the Wi-Fi off and transport yourself to where the voice of God is heard and he will speak to your heart. As Hosea said, I will allure her into the wilderness and there I will speak to her heart. So you see, the point of these studies, brothers and sisters, is really not very hard to grasp. What's very difficult is the application. And it's perhaps harder now than any other age in, in human history. You, know, you can read articles on, you know, that have been put out by people who have no connection with the Bible, no belief in God at all, and they'll tell you that the Internet destroys your mind. 
You know, they'll tell you that television damages the left-hand hemisphere of the brain, whether it's a good program or not. You know, that's what people in the world say. You know, they've got no connection at all with, with the Bible. So we've got to put away those things. John had no possessions. He had no status. He had a very low opinion of himself. But he lived what he taught. And God was able to get through to him. His clothing is desert. His food is desert. He lives in the desert. So let's come to have a look at him now in the desert in Luke chapter 3. The day of his exhibition unto Israel. What went ye out to see? To see, asked the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, here, here it is. Now, good Bible study is, is always based, as we've been taught, on good Bible reading. And here is one of those passages of Scripture where all you have to do is read it. Because the message is so evident. Verse 1 of Luke chapter 3. It lists all of the world's greats. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being the tetrarch of Galilee. I mean, how's this for a who's who of names? And his brother Philip, tetrarch of Itcherea, and of the region of Trachonitis. And Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest. The word of God came unto John the son of Zacharias. Where? In the wilderness. You see, there's all the world's greats, real prizes, some of them. And there's all their territory. And it finishes up with the last two, the high priest of the God of Israel himself. And the word of God went past every single one of them. And it goes to John in the wilderness wearing a camel skin. In the wilderness, really, whose territory none of those guys would have wanted. You know, God can't get through to Tiberius Caesar. He couldn't get through to Herod. John tried with Philip and Herod Antipas. But God's word just wouldn't find room in their life. But God could get through to John because he was unencumbered with the things of this life. He couldn't speak through Herod. He couldn't speak through Tiberius Caesar because the things of this world were too important. They had a position to protect. They had riches to preserve. But when you're thinking about those things, brothers and sisters, you can't think about God. And so the word of God goes past every one of them, and it comes to John in the wilderness wearing a camel skin. He's not asking us, brothers and sisters, to do any more than what he's doing himself. There is his message. We have to leave the world. We have to leave our possessions we have to put behind materialism. We don't need those things. All we need to live a godly life with contentment is the things which God provides, food and raiment, and, a, and time to study the Bible. So John was down here in verse 3, and he was baptizing, it says, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, to a Christadelphian, of course, this is a very familiar concept. Baptism we are all very familiar with. But you see, you have to understand what the scribes and Pharisees taught. See, they, saw, they taught there was a difference between Jews and, well, we'll call them Gentiles, but they called them dogs. And a Jew, when he came to the age of 13, we know was inducted as a son of the covenant in a very elaborate ceremony. But, but what if a Gentile wants to be a son of the covenant? What do you have to do? You got to wash him. Baptism was something that Jews reserved to wash filthy and unclean Gentiles. Now, what's John saying here? This is absolutely staggering to them. It's not just Gentiles who've got to get baptized. You've all got to get baptized. Unless you are prepared to all go down into the muddy stream of Jordan and confess that all flesh is grass, then there's no way that you're going to find repentance. You know, imagine, imagine a Pharisee having to, to lower his, his dignity to that, you know, with his, his royal robes and his broad phylacteries. You've all got to get down into that muddy mess and confess who you are. Have a look at what John was to do. Come back to John's chapter, Isaiah 40. So we've said we, we're going to be here in every session because this is the work of John all spelled out, not just in the Gospels, but it's all predicted here by Isaiah. In view of John's preaching, the glory of Yahweh was to be 
revealed, says verse 5. The glory of Yahweh was to be revealed, and all flesh, verse 5 of Isaiah 40, shall see it together. The word together there really means to become alike. It's the word ekad, which means to be united, to, to become alike. This glory will bring everyone to a common level, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, no matter your race, everything will be brought to a common level by what John is about to do. All distinctions will disappear. And it was the glory of Yahweh, it says, that will, that will do that. Now, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, you needn't turn to it, but it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's the glory of verse 5 being revealed. That's in John chapter 1. John chapter 3 deals with Nicodemus, a man who thought his blood was blue and everybody else's was red. And John chapter 4 deals with a corrupt, evil woman of Samaria, the other end of the scale. And God brought them together. He met Nicodemus at night. He met the woman of Samaria at the blaze of day. He said to Nicodemus, God so loved the world. He said to the woman of Samaria, salvations of the Jews. He brought them together. He narrowed Nicodemus's perspective, and he, sorry, yeah, he broadened Nicodemus's perspective, and he narrowed the woman of Samaria's, because all status, all positions, everything fades into insignificance in the view of that glory, and every valley was to be exalted. Every mountain and hill was to be made low. The crooked places shall be made straight. And so those lives that were crooked in God's sight would be straightened out and the rough places smoothed over. Now, there are four classes in that verse. There's the valleys, there's the mountains and hills, there's the crooked places, and then there's the rough places. And when we come to the record of Luke chapter 3, there are only four classes of people who ask John questions. There's the common people that he elevated, the scribes and the Pharisees that he leveled, the tax collectors with all their their crooked dealings as tax collectors, he he straightened them out, and down came the Roman soldiers with all of their brutality, and he said, do violence to no man. He smoothed them over. What a remarkable fulfillment there is of Isaiah chapter 40. Those are the only four classes that asked him questions. The common people whom he elevated, the scribes and the Pharisees whom he leveled, the tax collectors he straightened out, and the rough, brutal Roman soldiers. They said, what are we going to do? And he smoothed them over. What we now want to consider is what he said, in fact, to each class. Come back to Luke chapter 3. So the glory of Yahweh is revealed, and all flesh will be made alike. So who comes there? Well, of course, it's the scribes and the Pharisees, as you can expect, that that come first. They make their presence known immediately. Luke chapter 3 and verse 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, in verse 7, where it says there, the multitude, we know from the parallel account in Matthew chapter 3, that this, in fact, was the scribes and the Pharisees. They come first to be baptized. Do you know what a Pharisee means? The word Pharisee? It means a separate one. It's a separate one. Have a look at who they're talking to. Who's separate? John the Baptist or them? Down come the separate ones, and, and John doesn't even let them open their mouth. The Pharisees, who you know could talk, who make long prayers for a pretense, they don't even get one word in this record. John just cuts them off. Before they even get there, he says, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. So in Isaiah's prophecy, the mountains are now going 
because they were the mountains of that day in Jewish society. They were the clergy. The mountains are now, shh. John doesn't even let them get a word in. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And, and what he's actually doing is he's really drawing on the, the figure of the land. You see, Jordan overflows its banks during the time of harvest, every spring. And if you've ever seen a, wall, uh, you know, a river flood and then recede, what it does is it leaves behind it all the, the debris and the, the trash and the, the sticks and the, the leaves. It leaves that behind it as, it as it recedes. Then in the land of Israel, it gets really, really hot. And it bakes all of the debris and the bracken and the trash that the Jordan has washed up. And it makes it really, really hard. And it's really caked. And in John's day, you know who got down into, into all that debris and all that bracken? Snakes. You know, in Zechariah the prophet, in Jeremiah the prophet, he warned people about the Jordan. There were vipers down there. There were lions down there. It was a dangerous place. And so what the farmers used to do is they would sometimes put the torch to that trash and all that bracken down there along the Jordan, and out would come all the snakes fleeing away. Oh, serpents and generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, says John. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. See, the mountains are being leveled. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1 said this, The day is coming that shall burn as an oven. And yea, upon all that are proud and all that do wickedly, and he will leave him neither root nor branch. And the end of that chapter says, Behold, I send you Elijah. So here is John drawing on the figure of the, of the times. You know, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You generation of vipers. Bring forth fruits, meat for repentance before I ever baptize you. They don't even get a word in. They don't even get a word in. You see there in verse 7 where it says, O oh, generation of vipers, the word actually is a little brood, a, a little brood of snakes that would be fleeing from the, this fire that the farmer would, would use to, to burn up all that trash. The little, little brood of, of snakes. Many years later, Jesus came along and he called them a generation of vipers, but then he said, O oh, generation of vipers, he said, ye serpents. And he used a mature word, therefore, for serpents. They're just a little brood here. But by the time the Lord comes along in Matthew chapter 23, where he absolutely up abrades them for their iniquity, he calls them serpents. So this little brood had now matured in its iniquity and it had become a full-blown serpent. You have to change your thinking before I'll ever baptize you. By the time the Lord came, they hadn't changed and they had grown up. Now, just to remind ourselves where we are, John is baptizing right here where this, this arrow is at Bethabara. Bethabar, you may remember, was where the children of Israel crossed in the days of the Exodus. He's not baptizing in the Dead Sea. He's baptizing a little further north in the Jordan at Bethabara. You know what he says next? He says, don't think to say within yourselves that we have Abraham to our father, but I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Do you remember what Joshua did with the stones when they crossed? You see, there were stones in the Jordan, in the muddy filth of Jordan, that the priests had to pick up 12 of them and put them in the land. And then Joshua, not the priest, Joshua took 12 stones that were native to the land, native to the land. He took those 12 stones and put it back in Jordan, and Jordan washed them over. Joshua did that. God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So, just because you're native to the land, just because you're Abraham's natural descendants, that doesn't mean anything. Joshua took the stones that were native to the land and stuck them in the Jordan. And then stones that weren't native to the land, you could say Gentiles, stones that aren't native to the land were picked up out of the muddy filth of Jordan and put in glory in the promised land. God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And he just keeps on going. I mean, the indictment just, just you, you get a feeling here for 
this, the way John thought about these people. He, he knew they absolutely needed a dressing down. And he says, the ax is laid, verse 9, at the root of the tree. Every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. You know, when Israel planted a fruit tree, they weren't to touch it for three years. They were to leave that alone and give it to God. If it did bear fruit, in the fourth year, they chopped it down. So John is here at the beginning of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, which lasted three and a half years years. And he's saying there's an axe at the root of that tree. You've got three years. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Three years later, Jesus comes along and he gives a parable in Luke chapter 13. A parable of, of a fig tree in a vineyard. It had been going for three years. It hadn't brought forth fruit. And he says, cut it down. And someone says, well, let it go a little further. Let, let's see if it, if it brings fruit. If it doesn't, then cut it down. Look at the correlation now between John and, and Jesus in their teachings. And your brothers and sisters, we don't know how much longer we have. Is it three years? I don't know. There's an ax. It's there. If we don't bring forth fruits meet for repentance, I like to think about that verse because I think, you know, I think I've got an unlimited amount of time in life. You know, I always, one of my worst problems is I think, well, I'll do it tomorrow. But there's an ax if I don't bring forth fruit. We've got to do it now. Today, if you will hear his voice, said the psalm, harden not your hearts. He's, you know, what, a, what a verbal blast this is from, from John. Who could stand up to that? The mountains? Shh. Not accepted. Don't come here until your attitude changes. What about the valleys? What about the yous and me's? What about the working class? Verse 10. The people, this is the common people, asked him, saying, what, what shall we do, John? You know, the, the common people, they, they would have just witnessed the Pharisees, you know, getting upbraided. And they'd have been a little bit more confident. You know, John, we're not like those guys. You know, we, we're not proud. We're not materialistic, you know, we're, we're, just, we're just common folk. We're not like those Pharisees. What, what should we do? He that's got two coats, give one away. And every eye in that audience would have been on his coat. And if he offered you his coat, brothers and sisters, you wouldn't take it. And he that has food, let him share it. And all eyes are looking at a handful of grasshoppers. And if he invited you to dinner, brothers and sisters, you'd feel sick. Those are the only two things, in fact, that we know about John's personal circumstances. And they're the only two things he tells the common people. What he ate and what he wore. You know, as I was going through these notes this morning, I was, I was thinking to myself, you know, I, I would love to be in that position. You know, I would love to be able to, to tell you today to, you know, you need to do this in your life and you need to do that in your life. And, and every one of those things that I'm telling you, I do in mine. But, but I don't. But see, John could say that, you know, without any hypocrisy at all. You know, I've, I've got, a, you know, nice suits. I've got a car. I live in a better than average home. You know, I wish I could stand up here and say, you know, whatever you see me do, do the same yourself. But he could. He wasn't asking any of us to do what he hadn't done himself. Share your coat and share your food. You know, hearts, hearts would have melted. You know, the common people come up confident. They've just watched the Pharisees get blasted. They say, we're not like those guys. Well, what do we do, John? And then they all look at his coat. And they all look at his food. And they think, oh. Well, now they have something to think about. Now they have something to, to think about. John didn't let anybody off easy. And what he told the common people, that those are the only two things we know about him, his food and what he ate. So they now have something to think about. So the common people, as opposed to the scribes and the Pharisees, the common people are elevated. 
If they could take that advice and put it to practice, they would be elevated. Now, who's next? Class number three, the publicans. Now, these, of course, are the people. They are the crooked places of Isaiah chapter 40. The, all their crooked dealings as, as tax gatherers, and they're going to be made straight. They're going to be smoothed over. You know, the tax system in that day was, was known as the farming system, and it was full of corruption. You had the, the treasurer in Rome who was at the head, and he would say to his under-treasurer, you know, look, I don't care what you charge. This is my cut. And then the under-treasurer would say to the under-under-treasurer, uh, look, I don't care what you charge, but the Roman treasurer needs this, and I need this, and well, whatever you charge is your business. And then the under-under-treasurer would go to the Matthews and would go to the, to the Zacchaeuses and say, well, the Roman treasurer wants this, and the undersecretary wants this, and the under-undersecretary wants this, and I don't care what, what you get, but um, this is what we need. And so people like Zacchaeus and people like Matthew had to charge exorbitant amounts just to get, to get any way to survive. It was called the farming system, controlled by the, the treasurer in Rome. They had to charge incredible amounts, which is why people hated them. You know, I thank God that I am not, as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. I mean, it's hard to, to overemphasize how much these, these guys, tax collectors, were despised. So what does John say to them? Is he going to let them off easy? Verse 13, exact no more than what has appointed you. Oh, that really hurt. I mean, there's, there's no place that you can hurt someone in the world more than hitting them in their pocket. I mean, every time you hear of a tax increase, you know, every time you get a bill in the mail, I mean, it hurts. He says, if the taxes say that's how much you receive, then that's what you receive. Only tax what you need. Exact no more than what is appointed to you. Oh, that would hurt. Because you see, all the cream is gone. All the, all the extra that, that, a, that a tax collector would want, that's all gone. Only tax what you need. I mean, he may get a little bit of commission, but all the cream, all the extra money has gone if you follow that advice. You know, you live paycheck to paycheck. Just exact no more than what is required you. Only take what you need and nothing more. Oh, the, that, the rough places would have been straightened out, wouldn't they? The crooked places. They would be straightened out in the view of, of that advice. You know, one thing that impresses me every day is when Paul said, the love of money is the root of all evil. There is not a crisis in this world. There is not a crime that is committed that does not have somewhere along the line to do with money. Money is at the bottom of every ill that we see in the world. And that's where John hit them. Exact no more than what is appointed. Exact no more. That would have really hurt. I mean, these are already people who are ostracized, people who are hated, people who maybe need a, needed a lift up in life. He said, you only take what you need. He didn't necessarily tell them to, to give up their vocation. He said, only take what you need. Be content with what you have. The crooks were straightened out. And you know who the fourth class was that came down? Of all people, down came the Roman soldiers in all their brutality. And as they sent their delegate to John, you know, the guy would have plunked his spear in the ground and say, what do we do? In a, in a threatening manner. Hey, you, what do we do? What do you have to say to us? And did John shrink back in, in fear? John told them three things. He said, do violence to no man. Don't accuse anyone falsely. And be content with your wages. Now, the three things really all have to do with one thing. And that's money. Do violence to no man. What they would do is the Roman rations were very, very small. And so what would they do to make extra money, get extra rations, they would threaten people. They would do violence to them and take their rations. He says, do violence to no man. 
nor accuse any man falsely. You know, if they wanted to get in the good graces of a, of a high-ranking general or, or, or legion in, in the Roman army, a legionnaire, they'd go to him and say, well, he, you know, so-and-so is plotting against you, and there's this, uh, there's this aim to, to take down your position. I'll tell you all about it if you pay me. And be content with your wages. The Roman soldiers did not make very much. All three of those things actually have to do with one thing, money. Brothers and sisters, how much did John have in the bank? Think money worried him? How diversified was his portfolio? Are we content with our wages? If I was to tell you that you're going to get a 20% pay cut starting next month, how did you feel? A 25% pay cut. A 30% pay cut. How would you feel? Would you still be content? I mean, it's one thing to say, I don't have a problem with money when you got plenty. But what if, what if someone started, started poking you and started taking more, and they're taking more now? How would you feel? Be content with what we have. And I, I think what that means at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, is that we always live within our means. We should always live within our means. We don't rack up credit cards, you know, we don't spend beyond what is necessary. We live within our means. If we're a wife, we learn to live within our husband's salary. We don't spend beyond it or or look for ways to to get around the the barriers that he has set. We're content always with what we have. John says, take the salary you've been given, Roman soldier, and be happy with that. The rough places were made smooth. You know, I wonder how you could have been a Roman soldier after implementing those three things. I mean, I don't know if you could. I mean, this was a verse that back in the days of the Vietnam War, our brethren would be getting hit with. You know, so you see, John doesn't say give up their, their job as soldiers, does he? Well, if you put into practice that advice, I don't know how good of a Roman soldier you'd be. Because that was their lives. That was how they survived. But... He smoothed them over. And so there is the summary. Every valley shall be exalted. The common people were elevated. Every mountain and hill, the scribes and the Pharisees were leveled. The crooked places were made straight. And the rough places plain. Or as Isaiah 40 put it, the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed and all flesh shall become alike. Everybody's on one level after that exhibition. The crowd would have gone home, and not only would they have been really struck with what they heard, brothers and sisters, but it says in verse 15 that all men mused in their hearts whether he was the Messiah or not. If they're thinking, oh boy, I hope he's not the Messiah, because if he's the Messiah, oh boy, have I got to clean up my life. Because his, his example was so unhypocritical. Everything he said, he did in his own life. You can imagine the common people, you know, heads down low and thinking, well, you know, I, I really wanted a vacation and, you know, I, I really wanted to live in prosperity like a Pharisee, but, you know, I guess it's best that I, I share what I have. And the Pharisees, would have, the Pharisees would have murmured to themselves, you know, who is he to call us those names in front of the people? I mean, we came down here with, with good intentions. We thought we were serious and, and, and he said all those things about us, about fleeing from the wrath to come and... You know, the publicans would, would go away and, you know, they'd say, well, you know, it's, it's one thing for him to say not to charge more, but, you know, I've, I've, I've got to make a living and, and I've got to do what I've got to do. And, well, the, the truth may be important and I may need to get down to my Bible study and I may need to go visit those who are sick, but, you know, I've got to earn a living too. Uh, you know, and if I, if I do what he does, if I play it straight, then I'm not going to get the things that I want. And the soldiers might say, well, you know, it's, it's one thing for him to be living in a desert, but, but how can we do this occupation if we're not violent? If, I, if I'm not rough, if I don't, you know, mess people up and, and hurt them, then how can I make a dollar? And, and, and all of that, that really hurts. So they're all musing in their hearts whether John is the Messiah. Do you know why? Because all of them, Pharisee, commoner, publican, 
and soldier would, would have to say in their hearts finally that, that however difficult it may be for me, I cannot say that guy's a hypocrite. What went you out to see? Asked the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that tells us, brothers and sisters, about the power of an example. The name of John became a household word all over the world, as we saw in our opening point. They knew him in Asia Minor. They knew him in Egypt. He was all over the land. Not because he broadcasted how great he was, but because of his awe-inspiring example of singleness of mind. He lived what he said. Now do we. If we say something, do we do it? If we say we're going to do something, if we say we're going to fulfill a commitment, do we do it? Or do we drag our heels? You know, heads would have been hung in shame on that day. But, you know, Luke doesn't leave it there. I'd like to finish with verse 18. You know, the people would have all gone away in their hearts and, oh, that, that hurt. And how am I ever going to apply that? But that's not all John did on that day. Well, in verse 18, it says, And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. I'd like to just give that to you from, from the diaglot. And exhorting many other things, he proclaimed glad tidings unto the people. Glad tidings, that's Isaiah 40, unto the people. So you, you picture Don, John down there on the, on the Valley 4. He had left them with, with stinging rebukes, advice that, that would have been really, really hard to implement. It would have hurt. I mean, to, 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 be, to tell a publican, you've got you to gotta only charge what is necessary and what the system says would have been very difficult. You know, telling the soldiers you essentially have to give up your jobs if you want to survive would have been very, very difficult. But, you know, the strength of that beautiful golden voice didn't just dwell upon the negative. He also went to the positive. You know, he would have said to the Pharisees, he would have said to the people, let me tell you what the kingdom of God is going to be like. He gave them encouragement. Yes, yes, I know I've had some hard things to say. Yes, I know I've had some, some difficult things to say. But, but let me tell you what the kingdom is going to be like. See, he gave them an incentive to press on. He gave them motivation to continue. And whilst to, to bark at people may have its place, we have to supplement everything we say that's hard with some, with some kind of encouragement and make people in our number feel like it's worth carrying on, like the kingdom is worth fighting for. Otherwise, we'll never really change anyone. And so verse 18 says there that, you know, yes, John had some hard things to say, and we have some hard things to say at times too, especially in this age where, you know, we can see the world making inroads into the brotherhood. You know, we can see that, that things are challenging, and we have to point out those challenges, but, but let's make sure that we're also giving people a reason to carry on. That's what John did. With many other things in his exhortation, he preached glad tidings unto the people. You know, it's, it's the majestic and, and powerful expositions that have changed me far more than getting a lecture from someone. You know, it's those positive things that we hear from the Word. Even the most simple exhortations have been the most powerful because they encourage me that, yes, it is worth going on. So what went we out to see, brothers and sisters? Look at those four classes. Put yourself there. How are you going to apply that advice? You know, so as we lay in bed tonight, as we, we go to bed, you know, let's, let's try to get a mental picture of that, of that day. As John is down there on the valley floor, exhorting all of these people, you know, let's, let's say in our prayers before our God that we, you know, we'll try to make the most of the time that we have left. Let's take away those things that in our lives are not necessary to say that, you know, I'm sorry, Lord, for the time that I've wasted in my life and I want to use it better and grind on in this wilderness and help me to make time to hear the voice, the voice that kings and queens and prime ministers and presidents will never, ever hear. And that's the wonderful voice of God's word. And let me never cease to be impressed with the power of what I went out that day to see.
Thank you again, Brother Ryan.